one of the strangest recordings, which we didn't think would get into the hip brain, but it did, was born of a tune I'd written for the theme tune of the second of the concerto series, for which I did for EMI, for Norman Newell. The concerto for Dreamers started off as a tune with or orchestra. It was a beautiful arrangement by Brian Fay. Jeff Love conducted the orchestra. And later on, I took the, the tune, the recording, to Lionel Bart. You're playing these great melodies. He, 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 does, he does compose highly retentive melodies, as it happens, which is basically simple. Again, like the man. But it's retentive. You hear one of his songs once, and you, you know it. And uh, I did a little for, for uh, that uh, piece. It's called Always You and Me. And uh, Russ made a record of it where he just spoke the lyric against himself playing. And it's a very moving thing. It still stands out, I think. You can multiply, or you can divide. But answers must agree that in the end, side by side, there's always you and me. You can take away two from three, and you'll be left with one. But if you take away you from me, I'll be left with nothing. first wanted to get married back in 1943, just after I'd joined the Royal Navy, and I met this blonde wren. She was a platinum blonde wren from Scotland, Scotty, Scotty, we called her. And, um, you know, there was a very young juvenile thing, and she was very young, and it didn't work, particularly when I came on my first leave and saw her sort of sat across the knees of about six other sailors in the same pub. So that sort of <laughs> didn't work too well, didn't take off, in fact. There was another young lady with who I won't say too much about because she's still alive. And I think we could have married had her father not said to her while I was at, uh, working in, in pubs and playing the pianos. And he said to her, I'm not having a daughter of mine marrying a professional beggar, which sort of put the kibosh on that and we parted company. Mm -hmm. Then I wanted to marry again in, way back in 1963 to 74. And she was a beautiful girl, Hazel, her name was. She was a lovely woman. Um, and I went abroad. And unfortunately, she went into hospital for what appeared to be quite a minor thing and died while I was abroad. Mm. So I don't think there's anything more in the future. She's a very lovely girl, but I think here again the press and press agents made a lot more of that. I was going to, um, where was I going? In 63, I think I was off to South Africa. And she'd asked me if she could come to the airport, and I said, by all means, come on, you know, make it a half a day out.
plans can be very, very glorious, and one or two of them can be uh, problematical. There was one, um, it was quite humorous, although it was rather sad at the same time. I found her one night in my coal cellar, in my coal shed, if you don't mind. She didn't come out singing Mammy or anything like that, <laughs> but she came out with a tray of tea singing Tea for Two. Um, now, what do you do? You know, there's no answer to that sort of thing. <laughs> but fortunately, there are not many waitresses who hide in cold sheds. Stardom is a man-made definition. It's a man-made word. You know, superstars come with mainly with television, or if you sell a million records, kind of thing. Uh, if you sell fifty thousand records, now you're a superstar. This necessity which is banged into everybody nowadays. It must be top of the hit rate, top of the hit rate, top of the hit rate. You don't have to be number one in the hit rate. You have to be confident in what you can do. Know that you can do it. And don't try and exceed your limit. Don't go outside it. Then, if you know you've got an audience, then I believe it's your, it's your job, it's your duty. If you've got a talent, it's your job to go out and give it back. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting more like it now, isn't it? Right, I want two big four. <laughs> in his early days, although I think he was very proud to be Russ Conway, I think sometimes it worried him a great deal. I may be wrong, and he may be naive of this, but he's a very gentle person, as you know, and I think that he used to enjoy his going into pubs for a pint of beer and walking around the town, and, um, you know, just generally taking life like the rest of us do, but as soon as he became a, a superstar, of course, he was recognised and worried by everybody, that, which is lovely, and it's a lovely thing to happen. I and mean, stars all need that, otherwise there wouldn't be a success. I don't really like adulation. I love the applause, because that's um, appreciation of what you've done. But once you're off that stage, um, 
It um, strikes me as odd that there is so much adulation can follow you around after you've done your job. I could identify with this problem because in another way, I've had to, in my life, had to put out a facade all the time. And some of us can't really handle all that acclaim. And uh, when you want to unwind and, and, and you have to still go out and present this person that you're not really, it's very difficult. And uh, Terry, Terry, together with quite a few people I know, have problems handling that. They're usually the real people, which he's one of them. I always think of us as the kind of boy next door. In fact, that was the image that I tried to promote on records, that um, he was the kind of boy that lived next door, and you went in and said, oh, give us a tune, Russ. I mean, that, to me, is, is sums him up. And I often wonder whether, in the long run, it wasn't a responsibility that I had, and, and uh, whether one did the right thing. I don't know. Only Russ can tell me that, and I don't suppose he ever would. <laughs> Stardom, to me, it was a showcase. I think all those years, it was a showcase. Uh, it was a... Can you survive it all? Can you, can you get through it and you survive? I bought myself a, an old sort of tarted up ambulance. You know, it was an old box hall with the light on top and an ambulance. And the psychiatrist said to me later, he said, the way you were going, your next purchase would have been a retired hearse. <laughs> which I thought a lot about, you see. When I had a stroke in 65, yeah, Ralph had a factory down in, just in Cleveland, and I thought if I could get away from show business for a while, I'd, uh, it would help me. Trevor phoned me one evening and said that he was rather up. Oh, I don't know. He wasn't feeling too well. And would I go up to London and fetch him back? And I did. We went up there and brought him back from Surrey. And he, he came down and, and sort of partook in the business, helped to run it, or at least he tried to. Got into the swing of things, and everybody down there liked him. And he just wandered around and. They used to say, Mr. Trevor this and Mr. Trevor that. But of course, they all went home and told all their friends they had rough on with them, the fact. And they thought he was very good. And he, he, he's got a very, he's got a charming way with him anyway. I think that I hadn't recovered enough. Things didn't come together again until the end of 66, 67. But then in 68, I became ill again. And it, and it took a long, long time. I don't, don't want to keep on about that. You know. But it took a long time, and if anyone I know has a stroke, and I, I always try to say to them, don't expect to get over it easily. And when you really think, when the first time you think you are over it, that's the dangerous period. That's when you've really got to take it carefully and tighten up on yourself and be in strict control of yourself. Later on in March 1969, my housekeeper brought me up a newspaper. She said, there's some very sad news for you, Russ. And there it was on the front page. Billy Cotton had died the night before from a major heart attack. I was utterly shattered. Uh, far more so than I ever thought I would be. I didn't realize I was so fond of him yet. You know? And I went to his funeral, came back home. And my secretary was there, and she put a quite a few letters and things to be signed on my desk and I said, well, leave those, I'll do them tomorrow morning. And I was, the next thing I remember is 10 days later, and I, I, to this day I don't know what I did for those 10 days, but I was so shaken by Bill's death that I, I completely lost touch with sort of reality for a while. You know. I was very, very comfortably off back in the early 60s. By 1971, I'd gone broke, almost. I had to sell the house in Surrey, repay the mortgage. I came out with about an £850 profit, went into London, having defurnished a 14-room house in Surrey, tried to sack it, most of it, 
into the uh, basement flat of a house in Notting Hill. It didn't succeed, so I sold everything and I sat tight in this two-room basement flat for two or three years and then started all over again, which I didn't mind at all. I'd learned a few, I'd made a few mistakes and I'd learned a lot of lessons by then. Mother was always confident about his uh, success. And I remember after the occasion I quoted when I was painting the church for hearing Shinner's solo, I used to get a little bit fussed at times to think I was very well. But I always remember her words to me. She said, one day, my son, you'll see his name in light at the London Palladium. And of course, her words came true. Regretfully, I think the tragedy was that she never lived to see it because she would have been very proud of him. And I think in a way, that also has had a mark not only on the three of us, but particularly on Trevor. And I feel at times some of his music, and particularly some of the nostalgic music, um, emanates from his thoughts and perhaps his feelings, like all three of us, of the loss of what was a really a wonderful mother. She was certainly our best friend. I was only just 15 when she died. So I don't remember a lot of her. I don't suppose I really knew her as a person. But she pushed me like mad musically. Anything I could do on stage, at the piano, at the organ, anything she pushed. Everything that she set out to do, I think, was basically about music, happy music, always happiness. I started writing an autobiography way back in 1953, and I think I had a cheek to do it, but uh, I was put up to it, you know, by someone who wanted to ghost it, you know. And the tentative idea was then, and still is, Mother, was it worth it? Well, <laughs> we've been through a lot, and, you know, there's, I don't know if there's anything yet to be squeezed out of the piano. I hope so. I think, I think so. Um, yes, indeed, it was worth it, every second. It is rather like as though my career is coming up to be the second time around. I've had no intention of retiring, not the way things are. And this compliment, tremendous compliment, that so many hundreds of thousands of people still come into my theatres. I'm working more now than I even did in about 1960. And we're talking nearly 30 years ago. It's a long time ago, that was. I enjoy doing what I do. I love playing the piano. I enjoy being here, you know, to to be able to, I mean, to be so lucky to be given the gift to play the piano, to, it's an instrument that anybody, children, can go to and just touch it and it, it'll give them something back, you see. I don't think one word could really describe him, to be honest with you. Uh, a man of many moods. Um, some sadness there with him, but, um, always in my company or i in his a good laugh uh prankster generous and um a gentleman i have a tremendous a uh, for russ as a friend and without being the slightest bit facetious or egotistical i certainly wouldn't have come on anybody's show other than russ Conner because i couldn't ever Financially, one could never, ever pay him back. And what is more, we have a camera D that is something very, very, very special. I think that Russ could come back tomorrow in the charts. What I would like to see happen is somebody use him for a signature tune of a TV series. If, they, if he wrote a tune today like he so easily can do, like China Tea or Side Saddle or Roulette, and it was used as the theme of a TV series with Russ's name at the end, music played by and written by Russ Conway. I'm quite certain that he would have a top ten and be right back where he was. And believe me, I would love to record him again. I think that, um, well, he's got that kind of magic you don't find every day of the week.
I wouldn't say this for his face, but he's always been a, a very, very good chap. He's one of the best, brother or not. He really is good, and I love him. Right. And as far up to date as I could get was to write a new tune, although alluding to the past. So here it is, and I called it a long time ago. <sighs> Thank you.